So I was 90% sure it's BT, but then I was like, I should make sure. Everybody fucks my name up. Yes, Mr. Trost. Mr. Toast. What is up, everybody? I am Jason Trost, the host of Business of Betting Podcast, Nailed It This Time. I have a very special guest this week, uh, Paul Beatty. Uh, Paul Beatty is somebody that I've known for years, and I'm really, really excited about having him on the podcast. Um, he's one of the first people, when I when I thought about taking over this podcast, he's one of the first people I thought, I can't wait to have this guy in the show. He's been behind the scenes in betting and gambling for 15, 20 years. I'll let him introduce himself in a second, but he's been behind the scenes. Uh, he has a technical background, and, and we've always really got into the weeds about what's wrong with the industry, how to make it better. He's got such interesting perspectives, and uh, you know he's not necessarily on all the panels, but he knows everybody in the industry and has been very involved, and I'm very excited to have him on. So welcome to the podcast, Paul. Thank you, Jason. Very kind of you. Yeah. Do you want to yeah, spend a few minutes? and? <laughs> yeah, just quickly. I'm, um, as you say, I'm a software engineer by training. Um, so I started off at Orbis when it was a small private company, which is now OpenBet, um, late 90s, early 2000s, um, well before they were just doing gambling software. Um, and we obviously built that into a pretty pretty big company. I ran various parts of that on the tech side and on the, the, the product side. And then for the last, I guess, 10 years now, I've been a consultant advisor in the industry and probably for the balance of that the last five, six years, we, um, I like to think of us as the number one tech DD guys for tech audits and uh, M&A. So loads of the M&A transactions, B2B, B2C, we, um, we evaluate those, look at all the tech. So we get to see a few things. Awesome. And we met because I was trying to hire you as our CTO. Uh, do you remember coming to her office. Yeah, that was good. That was good. Was lucky, you, lucky, lucky for you that that didn't work out, didn't it? Yeah. You, you might not be doing this podcast now. <laughs> um, yeah, that's right. That's right. In your... Um, you, you, it's okay. You can slide it very off. very effective um, uh, low-cost office in uh, East Central London. Yeah. Yeah, I believe... From memory, it's 3,000 pounds a month for like 5,000 square feet. It was, it was and insane. It, and it looked like it. Um, <laughs> Um, this used hotel from the sixties. Is it just my brain, or did the bathroom have a B day in it? Uh, I don't remember, but there were there was definitely leaks from the ceiling, wires coming down from the ceiling. It it, it had what they like to call in Europe character. Um, a true, you know, like a true startup. <laughs> and um, little did I know what a good tell that would be for when I'm looking to do my own angel investing. Watch out for the businesses that have got the really nice offices. Ah, There's that's probably, interesting. There's yeah. probably something going wrong there. Probably so. In fact, the two best that I've invested in, one of them was in in Times Square, and I swear, in it, it was it was probably a brothel. Um, <laughs> and they were currently or formerly, and it worked. Out. There was some very strange people coming and going, shall we say? Okay. Um, and who has an office in Times Square? But they did, yeah. and they did okay. So, um, anyway, interesting tales. Fantastic. As somebody that does tech DD behind the scenes working with company, I assume, I assume a lot of that tech DD is, is going on with M&A. You know, as everybody knows, the market's collapsed. Uh, a lot of tier one gambling stocks are down 50, 60, 70 percent. Like what's what's your take on this sort of the market turmoil? Is it sort of do you think it's a regression to the mean? Do you think it's just sort of a temporary blip? What's, what's your take? Um, you know. It's obviously a, a mark of a whole load of systemic factors um, with regard to interest rates. You know, anytime you're messing around with interest rates, and it's been coded in by the Fed, I think that's pretty well known. So things people have taken money off the table. Um, you know, valuations were obviously exceptionally high for all kinds of things. So I think it's across the board. I would say from a betting and gaming perspective, that the bit I find interesting is how you could have some truly Goliath multinational businesses in lots of regulated markets with demonstrable bottom line profit that are very stable and have been stable for years and indeed still growing. 
and how you, know, you had a whole flood of businesses coming to the market that were obviously new and exciting, but they weren't anything even remotely close to that from a financial perspective. Yet they had enormous valuations. So from my perspective, I think it's probably healthy that some of the wind is being taken out of that. And whilst it seems to be happening reasonably rapidly, it's probably been like a 9, 10, 12 months decline for some of them. So in many ways, it's managed. And obviously, new markets are still opening up in the US. So I think it's mainly mainly systemic. There was probably a good chunk of hubris there with things rushing to the market um, and obviously some very high valuations. But look, you know, if you've got gambling licenses in the US and you've got a sensible business and you've got a long-term path to acquire users at a reasonable cost, you're going to make money, right? So there's a yeah. business there. It's just how much pain do you have to put up with? What I think is interesting is... A, a number of those, those companies that were new didn't use their share price to acquire businesses in other parts of the world that were regulated and were profitable. So I think that's interesting. And maybe, you know, everyone's wise after the event, but why? Um, and obviously the PE guys haven't got involved and we do a lot in PE. And now that the valuations are becoming more reasonable, I guess, in their eyes, Will they become involved? And then will the non-US domicile businesses then come and buy some? So, you know, very difficult for a European business that may do really well. It may do, you know, 150, 200 million a year EBITDA. But if its market cap is, you know, low to mid billions, very difficult for that business to go and spend four or five billion buying something in the US that is not making money. Mm. Um, you know, JV, well, how could it buy something? I would imagine now, as the prices drop significantly, you could actually see the European and the rest of the world guys coming and looking to pick up some of those assets. So you think the big European giants um, are going to are going to go shopping in the States? Well, I think they'll at least then take a look. I think they can at least take a look at what's available. And if you then look at you know all these deals that occurred, all the big deals that occurred in Europe in recent years, you know they've all had very significant discussions around synergies. Now, if somebody can come along and buy a major U.S. domiciled operator much cheaper, but it gives them licenses, it gives them brand recognition, maybe it gives them market access because maybe there's a relationship with land-based casinos, for example. You know, you can see why that could be a good part of the story, mm. even though it may be a loss-making business. And if they can then strip out the technology and they can get a synergy there, and they can use, you know, their development team. You know, maybe that makes sense. As so as part of doing Tech DD, like, can you share how many deals that you've done in the last 24 months? I imagine that had to be, you know, the golden era of m and um... Just to be clear as well, whilst I come from betting and gaming, a good chunk of our business as well is also around um, sports media, which is also mm. inactive, although less buoyant. And mm. just in, in classic mobile games, which is extremely buoyant and continues to be buoyant. Um, I would say from a betting and gaming perspective, we've probably done 20 plus deals and aggregate value, I don't know, 10 billion US. No, I mean, how many like sing singular deals, not the, not the necessarily the dollar amount, but like how many? Oh, I would say probably around in, in betting and gaming, probably 20 or so, I would say that we've worked on that have okay. gone through. And I would say probably another, and this is quite interesting, probably another half dozen maybe eight that um, have not gone through, even though there may have been SPACs, even though there may have been all kinds of other bits and pieces. And I would say um, in some of those cases, maybe the findings around technology and product would actually be material. So is it fair to say that you were doing, you know, part of like rough numbers, one to two deals a month, like what, what's the last three months look like? Is it, has it dried up to zero? Is it, is it still one a month? Like what, you know, I think you have probably a good inside track as to the M and a, um, uh, activity. Has it yeah, really no, dried no. up or is it still going? No, still going, still going. Uh, you know, the, the, the strong businesses just keep plowing on. Plus some deals take forever, right? You know, the, for anyone who's looking to sell a company, you definitely want to be in an auction situation 
with multiple interested parties if you want to get a deal done quick. You know, some deals where there's one interested party, 18 months I've seen some of them, right? They can, mm. And obviously, during that time, we might do our projects at the start or midway through. Things can then change materially within the technology and the products as you then plow on. So you then kind of have to go back and redo certain parts of it. Um, so no, look, I would say we're still at probably around about one a month coming up. Um, what you do get now is you do get more phone calls from CEOs and CFOs wanting to do audits of their solution. So they want to get the security of, I've got an R&D budget. It's the second biggest thing after my player acquisition budget. Am I spending the money in the right place? Um, are there issues here that I could do things cheaper, more effective, you know, whatever it happens to be. So you get more of those discussions occurring. Mm. And as somebody that sort of had the inside track on tech, what, what do you think the state of the tech is in, in sports betting? In sports betting, I think there's obviously more parties have come to the table. Um, and it, just naturally, um, it's become a more achievable thing to develop. But I don't think the nuts and bolts of it have changed much at all. And I certainly don't think the output, so the UI that people see, has really changed much at all, which I think is really quite disappointing mm. because it's pretty much looked the same bar push technology and the like and mobile devices for the 22, 23 years that I've been doing this. You know, it's still an HTML div table. Right, it's still, you, you might now get a bit of pulsing of a price change, but it's really not that exciting. Um, so I think it's become more accessible because certain things have become more established. Um, at the same time, certain more niche areas that I would always have considered to be integral to a genuine sports book, like horse racing. Horse racing for me was just another sport. There was a whole lot of different weird bet types that we had to do. There's a whole lot of pools bets that you had to do. But, you know, as somebody who started in the UK and has been in the UK, that, how could you have a sports book without that? Mm. Turns out you can. Mm. That also turns out you can then take an enormous chunk of the complexity of betting out, right? Not all of it, but a huge chunk of it out. And I then think, well, it's about half a sports book, isn't it? Right. So people have jumped onto that in markets. You then get other things. You know, I've, I've come across large businesses that have no you know, traditional bookmaking businesses that have no liability management because 89% mm. of their bets are ACAs. Mm. Right. Now, that's that's a market norm in different areas. Again, I think, geez, how could you run a sports book without even having it's it's book. funny you mentioned that when when we founded Smarkets, um, we didn't have horse racing on for a year or two because you know I didn't really know anything about the sport and uh, you know we just started with with soccer primarily, and once we turned on horse racing, our volume you know more or less doubled uh, very quickly, and we were all looking at each other saying why didn't we do this sooner? Yeah, the concept that it's racing, right, which is like yeah. some sort of different thing. It's like no, it's a sport. Yeah. So regardless of reduction semantic, factors and all that kind of shit, you have to yeah. <laughs> kind of get I mean, into that. I think a good a good kind of leading indicator of the depth of somebody's sports book tech which I think is a good thing to look at with a lot of the more new businesses is how many data feeds they've got integrated and how many they actually use. Cause you get a so, lot who will be attached to one. So they've done effectively one integration and they're then marking that up, passing it through and the like, fine. That's a sports book. There's quite a big difference between that and somebody who might have 20 feeds, hmm. right? Which may include feeds from syndicates and the like, which are much more niche, but very important. That is clearly a much more significant business in terms of scale and therefore technology. So let's get into the weeds a little bit. When you say it's easier today to build a sports book, are you talking about an actual operator building the tech from scratch? Or are you talking about if I'm a company wanting to get in this space, I, there, there's more off the shelf components that I can go window shop and just sort of plug into my stack? What, which I, I, are, think, are you, I think both. I think both. both. Okay. Uh, because it's more identifiable. You know, when we were first building the stuff with OpenBet, there's not really much else to go and look at. You, you, you mm. kind of end up thinking about retail and you're like, so what is a reverse forecast, right? What's the TriCast? How does it work a rule four? There's nobody's mm. website to go and look at, right? Now, mm. 
there's a whole load of definitions you can at least go and look at. And, you know, so many people obviously hold up 365 is the, is the one they'll go and try and replicate or they'll use that as their source of truth. So there's just points of reference there. Operators doing it. Look, there are obviously some very successful operators out there who have core technology units that are fundamental to their business, who have and do build excellent solutions. There are also a whole very long category and a lot of tombstones of people who've tried to do it and have failed um, for you know, any number of reasons from technology choices where they were just broken when they started and it was never going to work with what they had at that time mm -hmm. through to people trying to come up with something avant-garde that you know maybe the the customer just doesn't doesn't want and therefore it's become too complicated too quick and again it doesn't work so, um, so i'm mainly interested in in like let's jump into the ones who are building their own sports book. How many, how many companies do you know of that are trying to insource uh, all of their technology um, to run a sports book? Um, actively doing it right now, I would say probably three that are trying okay. to do it. Even Can you name three, them? No. Even those three, I would say, are looking to buy in components. So in right. terms of somebody from absolute scratch, sorry, two were looking to buy in components. I would say there's one business in esports that is actually, I think, an interesting esports business that is trying to build it nuts and bolts up. You know, a lot of the businesses that are trying to do are, you know, they're buying in components. Um, what are the components they're buying? Yeah, they're buying in what they consider commodity. But even like within what? that. What are the you know, commodity what, components? Well, the commodity components you're looking at is that it's, I'll buy a sportsbook betting engine, right? Which has got these feeds integrated to it and it's got this settlement and it's got cash out and it's got some applications or some back office for trading or it's got an integration to a risk provider, right? It's, I mean, what you just described sounds like a... What you just described sounds like a sports book. I wouldn't necessarily yeah, call yeah, that well, the That's the point. That's the point. They're buying, they're buying that is the meat. Thing. Okay. Right? So the they're buying a whole thing. They're then taking apart the bits that they want and laying on top, which again, there are quietly several businesses that have floated around that have tried to do this, significant businesses, and they failed because uh -huh. it's not something where you have an off-the-shelf direct component. It tends to be, here is a sports book and it's all quite tightly integrated, even though it may be API-based. It's not like, I think, the way the casino world's gone, where you've got a remote game server and you've got an aggregator. There are probably hundreds of participants in that market. The APIs mm -hmm. are pretty simple and quite well understood. And they do get componentized and getting taken out. People are taking out gamification. They are taking out game wrappers. They are taking out a game engine, right? They can do that and they are doing that. Sports betting, there's still so few participants to it. And obviously speed is often of the essence. As you start taking it apart, there's not that much. So um, if I were a crazy entrepreneur with a glint in my eye, 26 year old, full of ambition, and I come to you and I say, Paul, I'm going to build the fucking best sports book of the future. What would you tell that entrepreneur um, what they need and how long it's going to take? Well, how long it's going to take, I think just as a general principle, is you better get to market as quick as you bloody can, right? Because otherwise you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna run out of cash. And that's one thing I've certainly learned in my investments is Get to get to market as cheap and as dirty as you can, obviously with all the regulation. But like, how much how much money would that person need? Because I remember Nigel Eccles, um, who founded FanDuel. I, I think he threw out a number, and I might be off by a little bit, but he said he estimated that it would take a hundred to two hundred million dollars to start a sports book. Does that sound like the right number to you, or, or, or more or less? I mean, look, it all comes down to your marketing money. I think technologically, that's way, way, way too high. Okay, yeah. so how much would you spend on the technology to, to build something from scratch and, and not using some, not bringing in parts, like sort of soup to nuts all in-house? All in I'd probably be looking to spend it 10. 10 million, and you that, think you could do it for 10 million? million. Yeah, of, course, I think, of course you could. Look, okay, so that begs the question <laughs> with all the, so all the money in the industry, like you and I both agree there's just a dearth of, you know, there's just almost no innovation in this industry. Like for as much money as in this industry, the technology is not very good. The innovation is very slow. Like 
if you're saying it's 10 million, I think it's more, but like, let's say you're right and it's 10 million, like that's an achievable amount of money to go raise. Why aren't there more from the ground up sports books who are really trying to change the game in the industry from your perspective? Because I think a, the, there are so many other things out there like the games market where you can get live much quicker, Mm. which we see all the time. And there is much wider audience with little to no regulation outside of things like GDPR that can be achieved very fast. I think the problem is that do people really want to come into gambling? So I think there's a, a social issue there and a perception issue there. And I also think that the regulatory landscape is significant. So if you are coming in to build your own solution, fine. I think there are plenty of people out there who can build solutions. You know, I do still see, you see people, little syndicate businesses who basically built kind of a reverse bet engine in some ways, right? To be able to manage their syndicate, they might make very good money. You know them, I know them. They've built pretty sophisticated solutions, certainly as sophisticated in many ways as a basic betting engine. I think they've probably spent 10 million or less building those. There's no reason you couldn't go and do it. But if you want to go and compete, you need so much additional on top money. You also then need to look, and I'm not saying they do this, you then need to look at changes in the industry, right? You could count on the fingers of one hand the number of times the major European operators have changed core platform in the last 22, 23 years I've been doing this. They don't change, yeah. right? They don't change. They may all be frustrated with it. There may not be much patting on the back going on, but it just about gets them to what they need. They're very cash generative businesses. Particularly if it's a listed company, does the listed company CEO want to spend three years of his maybe or her maybe three to five year tenure changing Therefore, not investing, potentially falling behind. It's a bit of a vicious circle, right? Mm. And if you've got something that works, particularly in an industry where a lot of things have not worked and we've seen things fail for all kinds of different reasons, do you want the risk? So it's one thing to build it and to spend the 10 million and to go and do it efficiently, right? And to go and find the right people to do it. It's a totally different thing to then go and start operating and find your edge, Now, I think there are interesting avenues there, and I think there are potentially huge ticket items, you know, you call it metaverse, you just got a a different view on betting. I think there are huge opportunities there to get into, but you need to have a bit of a different view of the world, and you need to be quite bold in that. And look, I think this is where betting and gaming is losing out to lots of other industries where people are innovating and spending their time. Okay, so you're saying 10 million for the tech and and then it's a shitload for everything else. So would you would you care to throw out a number for like how much you would need to kind of get something going off the ground? You know, do you think that 100 to 200 million is now sounding more more accurate no, I think, or do you I think, think that's you... reasonable when I think that's reasonable when you take I mean it all depends on the market, right? Yeah. I think that depend for player acquisition for sure. If you're going in with a reasonably standard sports book you're going to have to spend a lot. If you're going in with something that's non-standard, you're either going to have to find a niche, exceptionally difficult, mm. um, and hope for lower cost, uh, or you're going to have to spend money educating people as to what your new area is, and then you're going to have to acquire them into that. So I I probably agree with it in terms of aggregate. In terms of building the technology, which I think is where we started, no. And I think the core to that is, if you're building a bet engine, if you're building a settlement engine, Look, this is what the old old founder of um, CTO of Orbis, Chris, used to say. He's like, look, you know, nine women cannot make a baby in a month, right? But one of them can in nine months. And I think there is a certain element with some of these parts of the software that that works. If you were then looking to, you'd set up, you know, a, a sort of canonicalized data model for the data feeds, and you've got a good architect to that, yeah, sure, I think you can go and integrate in parallel multiple data feed providers, which is important. I think you can have teams doing UI, UX. But the reason I think it's relatively cheap is it's not a challenge that I think you throw 100 developers at. Yeah, I think it's something you start off with five, then you get to 10, then you get to 20. Then you have a sports book. Well, for the longest time, Paddy Power, I don't know what they have today, but for the longest time, Paddy Power 
uh, OpenBet had, I think, 10 to 15 developers, and they were the number one. You had other mm. customers who had 40, 50, 60, 100, right? So I think that in itself goes to show. Now, they were using a service that was customized for them. They were doing some things in-house. Other groups were doing other things in-house. But there was quite a variation between the number of staff. Now, if you can build Paddy Power and Sports Pet with, call it, 30 staff all in, that's a lot. And how much has it changed in the last 10 years? Various things have been added. Inplay was there. Cash Out was there. They were all they were all being developed before then and around that time. What are the big new innovations that have come in? I'm not mm. sure there is that much. I think there's the odd thing. I think a lot of it's UI driven. You say 30 Linux engineers software. though on 15, 30 engineers on Paddy Power. You're talking about the open bet setup, right? Which is the open bet was probably developed by hundreds of people in total over. 5, 10, 15 years, no? Yeah, that's what, that's what I think. I think that's where the, there's a total misunderstanding of what that business was. It's obviously different today. OpenBet was never really, we used to have this thing called OpenBet 4.5. That was kind of the big migration. You moved to version 4.5 and it would take like man years of developers to do this. This is like the early 2000s. That was the last thing that was really a standard product. Now, yes, the core betting engine, which was, you know, call it 50 libraries of files and I don't know, maybe a hundred thousand lines of code. I was developed by a very small number of people and mm. it really didn't change very much. What changed was all the websites and the portals that went on top and you know, the, the, the branding and some of the reporting of various bits and pieces that was not developed by hundreds of people that, mm. you know, and you then end up with branches, which diverge more and more and more and more from the core such that they ultimately become unrecognizable. Ironically, apart from the very core little betting bit, which never changed anyway. You know, once you place the bet, you place the bet, right? Mm. It's a bet. Stored in the database table, it's a bet. All the other periphery around it was the stuff that changed. A lot of that was very customer specific. So I never thought, and, you know, and there's been, again, I think there's been a number of tombstones created around people over the years when we tried to productize OpenBet. Mm. Customers may have said they wanted it, but actually what they always wanted was, yes, vanilla at a particular price, but they wanted an awful lot of sprinkles on top, right? When and we when found it, 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 they quite liked having their own team. And when it came, yeah, and I think on a related point to it, there's obviously been a big trend for operators to take UIs in-house, which I think is generally speaking a good thing. Yeah. I always found it amazing when they do that and they'd end up with large UI teams. I remember one operator in particular ended up with hundreds of staff. Uh -huh. And they're saying, well, we get so much more done now. <laughs> I, well, I think you had maybe four people at OpenBet who did your UI. Yeah. So you're spending vastly more money. So you're not comparing likewise. What, um, what is mental, what's crazy to me is like, if you compare sports betting to the like other industries, like, outsourcing your UI and outsourcing your betting engine, you know, these are just sort of like, it's madness if you compare it to other industries. You know, if you think about well, any sort of tier one tech company, they do it themselves. Like the fact that it's like some magical secret sauce that big operator A, you know, has its own UI team. Like it's, it's mental to me. I would certainly make the case for a business like OpenBet. I can see why it can come across as being outsourced. And I guess technically they do own this. Oh, you're considering open bet insource. I would say open bet is the classic outsource solution. No, I think, I think I would I'd probably say it can be more classic outsource. Cause I think you would, they would consider it their solution in house oh. and it's their developers who they know by name, who only work on their solution. They're right? just, you, know, you, you would be at open bet and you would be, I'm on the sky team. Right, you spend way more time speaking to Sky than you do speaking to people in other open bet teams. Yeah, but the core is still open bet four point five code. No, it's not. Even though you're on the Sky team and you put the blue on the website instead of green, you're still using the open bet you're not, core. You're not checking into the four point five branch. You're checking yes. into your Sky, which is so. To me, you're that's not, like you're not merging back in. To me, that's like an you know the interface layer. That's not like we own our technology. Uh, no, well, well, own the technology. Look, I think it's, I would imagine OpenBet have always owned the technology. I don't think there's yeah. any instances where the operator owned it. I guess the daily reality that I would have seen, and yeah, long, many years out of that business now, so God knows what it's like now. Yeah. 
It was, you worked on a team and you were identifiable to that team and you were definitely not thinking very much, certainly towards the end of my time there, you were definitely not thinking very much about the core open bet solution. You were thinking about your customer who mm -hmm. was frankly paying for your time to develop mm -hmm. the solution and you were providing it to them, much more service driven. If I then compare that to other businesses in the market, which... I would consider much more outsourced, where you've outsourced the trading, the pricing, mm -hmm. all these things. Obmet never did that. I think it does now have a, a, a trading unit, but mm -hmm. it never did that. The trading was always done. The pricing was always done. The operating was always done by the operator. Mm -hmm. So I think this is where you start getting into these nuances and hybrids that are quite important. And I think that's probably why Openbet have avoided some of the issues that have occurred with some of their perceived competitors who are really quite different businesses who manage the whole thing, right? Mm. Here is your solution. Here is your UI toolkit on the front end. Insert your uh, logo here. Changes, there is a team of people who you'll probably never speak to elsewhere in the world who will go into a roadmap and it will come out at some point in time. I get the distinction, but I still like, even, even after that description, I still would call open bet and outsourcing your technology, even though I think it's, you know, I think you're advocating it's a little bit closer to an in-house model. To me, that still sounds like an outhouse model. I wouldn't look, I wouldn't disagree. That's still yeah. actually, outsourced. they don't own it for sure. Yeah. Um, and the paychecks from open bet and, you know, then all that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, I, I, so, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. So going back to, um, you don't need that many people to build it. Um, that, that, that drives with what we did. You know, we basically built an exchange with, I want to say like 10 engineers. So you, you can do so much with so few engineers. And it's one of the magical things about, you know, if you look back at the startup journey, it's like those days when you have five people around a table and you're, you know, you're, you're getting stuck in, it's, it's fantastic. But, but what I would say is that, you know, the, the Pareto principle, you know, the last 10% takes, you know, all the time, you know, to do, once you sort of have the basic layer of the operating infrastructure, like adding more and more just takes more and more engineers. So it, it sort of explodes on you. Like the finessing of the sports betting operation, um, yeah. while the core can be built quickly, you still need quite a few engineers to, to maintain and grow it. Which exactly, and that's how you end up with hundreds of people doing UI and UX. Yeah. Well, I don't think you need hundreds of people to do UI. I think that's a sort of a misunder. That's what to to me. That's sort of what happens when you don't have tech DNA in your company. You know, you just sort of like you think that's how it should be done. So there's no way that a, a big operator should have hundreds of people doing UI and UX. That's that's crazy. Like I think that's just a classic. Uh, you know, it's it's it's. It's like I, I largely think of sports betting operators, most of them being marketing companies and marketing companies don't understand technology very well. And I think this is what happens when marketing companies try to do technology. Well, exactly. And I think um, I would agree with you entirely on that. Mm -hmm. And I would say furthermore, I think particularly on casino, but probably more and more on sports book, it's inadvertently an eBay marketplace, mm. right? Where I go in to effectively get a commodity, which for some people may be entertainment, for some people it may be habitual. I don't necessarily see much difference between most of them. There could be some bonus offers that are attracting me, maybe some longstanding loyalty to it, but they're very similar in terms mm. of look, which makes it even more bizarre that you'd have so many people. But you then look at, well, they're in so many different markets. And I come back to the, the example again about the guys who do the, the ACAs. Look, there should be a real opportunity to sell the ACA, right? That could be quite a different interface, actually. Quite interesting interface. Sell the ACA, not the, you go in, here's all your singles, and you have to build your singles up and all that, right? Yeah. For the Americans, um, the ACAs are uh, short for accumulators, which is, Americans call it parlays opportunities there for major change on it but even though you've got this core bet engine there, always, there seems to be quite a driving for well i need a bit of a different solution for market xyz but it's all quite different the ui needs to be quite different but it never seems to be all that different to me to, to my hypothesis is that 
sports betting is much like banking, right? The core of it's quite boring. You know, like I have a checking account. I need to put money in, take money out. That's the core of banking, right? And in, in the old school model, you got paid for holding your money in the bank and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, it's just moving money around. But Revolut really showed me that you can take such a boring product and make it so much easier, so much more powerful, like the, the bells and whistles that they keep adding on top of it. And the, the ease at which I can send a payment globally uh, with my phone, it's just, it blows my mind. Um, so to me, I think that's the direction sports betting should go, where it's like, at its core, placing a bet, a binary option is a boring thing. You know, it's not complicated. Everybody understands the math, but the technology around it, the user face around it, the power of it, all that stuff sucks. The pricing sucks. The interfaces suck. Getting money in and out sucks. Being able to trade out of your risk sucks. And so a lot of people in the industry, because they don't own their own technology, they're, 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 they're playing around the edges, you know, trying to add fancy new game here or fancy new product here. Whereas I think the core of sports betting should be focusing on the core and nailing this price, nailing the buying and selling experience, all that kind of stuff. So you were mentioning that it it's kind of a commodity, but, but I think you would agree. Nobody treats it like a commodity. Nobody thinks about it like a commodity. And our hypothesis is that, you know, the average margin in sports betting starts five, six, 7% per bet. My hypothesis is that it should be trending towards zero over the next 20 years at some point, it should get very close to zero, and that you would sort of think about it like a stock market where you have the kind of the wholesale price and then you have the broker that sits on top of it that adds their own bells and whistles. So if you were to think about sports betting like the New York Stock Exchange, like you would have an exchange that's kind of at the heart of it. That would be like your core. That's the wholesale price that institutions get access to. And then on top of that, you have the broker, which offers their you know, bells and whistles, customer service, all that kind of stuff. And I see sports books becoming more the brokers. But um, as intellectually interesting as that is, I've seen zero people in the industry getting excited about that vision and no operators moving towards that vision. <clears throat> so do you think that's true? Do you agree with that? Do you no, I, I totally agree. Look, I'm, I'm really excited about it as well, but I've been excited about it for probably 10 years to mm. change the interface from, from all kinds of different bits and pieces at its most basic. And I was looking, I was looking at some stuff last night for, for a customer actually on a, on a desktop, you've got in play tennis matches with a stream. You got all the markets listed. I think a couple were reordering as they became more relevant. Why am I not in a situation where they must know what I'm interested in betting in. So point by point, game by game, whatever it happens to be, right? Where I'm just opting in or opting out, right? Instead of having to go and hunt through, tick, add, all the rest <laughs> of it. I, I want a context. It's most big. I just want a context-dependent feed, right? Just give, give me a feed. I, I can, I can tell you why. I, I can answer that question. It's, it's, it's solvable, but it's hard to solve. That's the first thing. Like you, you can use machine learning and things like that to try to do preferences. Um, I remember at university, I said a computer science at university, one of the in vogue topics was to come up with a quote unquote recommendation engine. And I think back in the day, machine, you know, I was in school in like 2001, two, three, um, machine learning wasn't really in vogue is more, um, what's the word, uh, an empirical formula. But what I learned back then and what I learned now is that recommendations engines, even though they're conceptually very easy, they're crazy hard the only one i've really seen that i like is spotify i think spotify is magical at giving me songs that i never would have heard that i really like but i think like if you take a company like netflix i think netflix is in my opinion not very good at recommendations like i almost always watch uh watch a movie on netflix because a friend recommended it rather than um you know yeah. they said I think watch netflix this. is one of those ones that's got worse right and yeah that's an interesting discussion in itself so I think, sure I, I, think I, I think I, it's I, hard. I think it's hard, Paul, to. But I don't think it even needs to necessarily go that far to start with. You've got a relatively small number of markets in tennis when I'm in play. It could be pretty simple to say, look, when it's, and you've got a very defined number of scores in, in, in each game, 30, 30, love 40. Yeah. I think there's probably a few if statements there. Yeah, And I just love to be able to see I'm opting into the bet, right? And I'd also love to be able to see, just give me a little tennis bet slip, right? I don't necessarily need all of this other stuff. 
right? Uh-huh. That is consistent across everybody. Just give me a little tennis bit. I think that's a starting point. I think the other point, which I think is where the exchanges really come in, and this comes to kind of a Robin Hood way of looking at the world. You know, Robin Hood make their money by selling their order flow. You know, and they are currently a victim of the market and things, but they've had a huge number of consumers and clearly they've made it much easier to transact and they've got rid of the finance transactional fees for buying and selling share, right? They, they've done a revolute in that part of the market for, for buying and selling financial assets. What I probably want, particularly when the sites are very similar and they're really only differentiating in many ways through bonusing and little edge features, and colors. I probably want to be able to say, look, Alexa, Man United to win, Liverpool to win, and Radicanu to win. Right? Just go and find it for me. Right? <sighs> whether I've typed it, whether I've tapped it, whether I've read it in whatever, just go and find it for me. I don't care who takes the bet. Right, I'll assume that they're regulated and licensed. I'll assume that they're reliable. Just go, just go, basically, and I might set up, go and get me the best price or get me the best price that's available in the next five minutes, right? And just go, I don't care who it goes to. Give me a floating bet slip that exists with me, right? Kind of the ultimate affiliate tool in many ways, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And just go and do that. And I'm just not bothered about who's down chain. Now, can you ever get there with regulation? Don't know. As, um, as somebody that regularly speaks to my Google Home, I don't know if I want to be shouting bets uh, to my Google you, Home. You, you, that's what it was. Well, how you do? You get my point. I get Is your that, point. So I would say like odds checker bet slip sort of tries to like scratch the surface on that model where they basically say, here's all the prices, you know, the, yeah, they have the integrated bet slip. You still have to go and do it. You still have to go and do it. You still, look, we're all lazy. You yeah. still got to go and do the hunt. You still got to go and browse to that site to go and look at it all. You still got decisions to make about that, right? Let's just set it up. I've already made my decision, right? Mm. My decision is that by me, I've set it up. My configuration is go and find the best price for me immediately on this ACA or on this single, whatever it happens to be. And I don't care who it's on, right? Mm. I don't care who, I've already registered my credit card, that can go. Whoever the underlying clearing bookmakers are, it's gone. Right? So do you think anybody's that's working on that problem or 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 that's your that's your vision? I mean- Well, it's a vision why? that I think you get, you get the best price that's available for what you've asked for at that time, right? Mm-hmm. Which is obviously a big thing for a lot of people. You then get the convenience of, I didn't have to go and look it up. I didn't have to go to Lloyd's Banking mm. and set up some enormous page for my foreign payment. Right? I didn't have to go and do that. I just had to tap a few small things and they filled it all in for me. Right? Mm. And they've got the KYC behind it and they've got the financial management behind it and they've got the licensing. Right? Just make it simpler for me. You know, do people really enjoy, maybe there are some, who enjoy going and browsing around hundreds of div tables for all the market to look at it i'm not sure i mean i don't think so I mean, people have spare not. time so why do you think like an exchange isn't the right answer for that because they don't have the exchange... liquidity or the price or like wh- why wouldn't the, no, why I... wouldn't an exchange be the right solution i think it is I th- I'm, I'm really i think this is where the exchange wins because it's got the flexibility to actually look at things that way and mm-hmm. also it's probably got a more open mind about hey I might want to take that bet and I might want to take it now, but you know what? In the future, I might want to go and pass it away because I might not like the way it moves. You know, I don't know many bookmakers who, if you know, very, very strict on their risk management and their liability management, not for regulatory purposes, for their own purposes. That's the bit I'm speaking about. Mm. Now, they'll just reject the bet. They won't think, oh, well, maybe I could go and push that into Asia onto an exchange. Maybe I could go to markets. Maybe I could go to Betfair and I could push it in there. And I could still have satisfied my customer and I could still potentially have made margin, right? Maybe a much smaller margin, but I can make margin. I don't think that it's just that it's a rejection, right? It's a bad user experience. So I think that the exchanges would be much more open to a view of, look, we've got a pool here. And we kind of all need each other. We're competing, but we all actually need each other as well. I've taken a bet. I've satisfied it. I don't know exactly where it's going to go, but I've taken a bet and I've satisfied it. Well, you know what? Maybe I can push that off to somebody else who wants that. 
Right. I totally agree with you intellectually, but I just I don't see any momentum in the industry uh, to move towards this model. So, like, yeah, if you take all. if you take the UK market, I mean, in and in, in including markets in this kind of equation, like exchanges have never gone really over ten percent market share. Like, why do you think that is in the UK? Probably the perception around the complexity to it and the very simple back and lay and what the hell does it does it mean mm -hmm. now? Once you know what it means, it's so intuitive to you and it becomes so second nature. But I think people are, again, so used to, here's a board of prices from a shop. Here's my div table. Okay, I just know that's a, I know that's a bet. I'll go and take that bet. Um, and you've also got to appreciate for a lot of people, it's not necessarily something they're going to do every day. It might be something they do once a week and they just want to get the bet on again, right? And they'll just assume, look, I'm always getting a fair price from bookmaker X, Y, and Z. Mm. You know, why, do you st why do people still bank with Lloyds? Why do people still bank with HSBC when there are so... You know, th there is definitely a level of apathy there. And also, they are good at offering a very... You know, a lot of the bookmaker schemes are good at offering a wider range of products that there is a solid group of customers who go across all of those and they like that and they want the rewards and they want their loyalty points. Mm. I think it can all exist. My point is there's been very little innovation in how a lot of this has been delivered. I agree with you. People are not developing these things, but if we're coming at an angle for what would be truly innovative, what would be really interesting, we've had all the prop markets. They've all existed for years. Coral Ladbrokes have run a kind of a parallel sports book with player props and all the rest of it. It's successful, but it's a tiny point of the market in comparison to the main market. Mm. So I think if we want to look at how it's going to innovate, I think it needs to be kind of a totally different way of looking at it and thinking about it, which will require a lot of money to be invested in it. It still needs to, at the end of the day, be a simple bet that people understand. But really what I'm speaking about is convenience. My hypothesis is, uh, is, is lines up with yours in that I, I think interface is the main reason exchanges haven't caught on. I think, you know, all the major exchanges use the kind of that, that back and lay order book is horizontal kind of um, UI element. And I think unless you're from the betting industry and, and have the patience to kind of learn it, it makes no intuitive sense. And, uh, you know, I've been frustrated that we haven't been able to move away from that interface as fast as I would have liked. I don't think it's a good interface. And I think that's the big bottleneck that keeps more people from interacting in exchanges is that kind of that, I would say, very jargony, insidery approach to uh, to sports betting um, is the way it's laid out. Um, awesome. What... Um, what do you think about the UKGC? Uh, you know, obviously there's a big uh, change coming down the pipe. What's what's your take on on the industry's regulation and and what's going to happen and what should happen? I think the UKGC have got an incredibly difficult job. Uh, I think they are all things to all people, even though that's clearly not in their remit. Uh, seems to be becoming quite the political football. Uh, what have they got? 350, 400 staff. They've got to do all the licensing. They've got to do all the enforcement. Uh, they've got to look at the future. They've got to look at the national lottery. You know, so many different things there that they've got to look at. Um, I think it's really, really tough. I would prefer it if there was a regulator that was solely responsible for enforcement and licensing, and that was its job, make sure the right people are licensed, companies are working to the guidelines, and that is that that is their focus. And you could call that the GC as it is today. And then I think it requires a separate organization to look at all the things around harm, which are obviously, some of it can be extremely harrowing. That I don't know anyone in the industry who takes that as anything other than very seriously. Um, but I sometimes feel that the, the GC, when you look at it, they're put in such a difficult position. They almost have to be seen as coming down so hard on the industry and on the operators that there's almost a, feels at times that there's almost predisposed to the operators are doing wrong things 
which you know, I've been doing this 20 odd years, whilst there are definitely things that have gone on that are not right, whilst there's obviously improvements that are being made and can be made and things can become safer. I don't remember any conversation ever around actually trying to cause harm, trying to cause addiction or any of those things. And I think sometimes it comes across that there's a built-in view of that is occurring and then the UKGC needs to act and be seen to be acting on that. Whereas I think a collaborative mm. approach would be much better. And I think if you carved out the health and the social health aspect for it and gave it the correct funding, and that could feed in independently to the GC in terms of you know, regulation and what should be enforced, I think that would be much more helpful and much more achievable, right? It would make the industry much better. Um, and I also think we need to speak about innovation. Are there any companies of any note that are spending any time on regulatory innovation? You know, there's not many. There's not many. If anyone knows of any, please, please come to me. I'd love an angel investment in that. You know, data needs to be made accessible. You look at some of the countries around the world where they do record everything central. I think Italy, you've got every bet by bet interaction over the bloody UDP data packets. <laughs> yeah. They're the genuine use of the blockchain, right? The safe systems that they've got in some of the Scandinavian markets. There's a yeah. genuine use of the blockchain. You can anonymize the data. You can have a session, you can have an amount, you can see patterns. You could make that available to licensed entities, KYC firms, all the rest of it, to go and do research on that, to go and look for patterns, to go and try and build tools around sensitivity. You know, look at everyone's mobile phone. I was reading something awful the other day about this poor guy who had a huge problem. Um, and he used to speak about his physical reaction to when he was betting and when he was making money. Now, every phone has got a camera in it. Mm -hmm. If you can detect that there may be a problem, is a suitable trade-off to say, look, we want you to switch on your camera as you are betting so that we can then go and look at certain things. Look what you've got on your wrist. It's taking your pulse and all the rest of it. There's a lot of people mm -hmm. with that. Now, if somebody doesn't want to do that, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. If somebody is willing to do that and you can do research around it, I think that's also interesting for informing the leading tells around gambling and what's happening. Okay. I, and so I think the more data, and I just feel with so many of these things, you know, the two pound stakes, why not one pound? Why not 10 pounds? Where's the data to be able to look at it? Where are the six month schemes to go and say, okay, we've run this trial for six months in this location. Here's what the data is telling us. Otherwise, I fear that you've got loads and loads of inputs around, you know, we want to do this in the gambling act. We, we you know, we, we got rid of credit cards. We did this, this, and this. Where are the outputs that are measuring what was done? Good if things are getting better. Great if things are getting better. But we need to understand why. And we need to be able to measure that. You know, credit cards. We got rid of credit cards. Good. I read something the other day. Said, well, okay, there was no discernible change in the betting volume. Okay. So what does that then mean? Did people then bet more with their own cash? Was that or a good or a bad thing? Did that deny them food, their kids' shoes, whatever it happened to be? Or were they then more sensible? Or, God forbid, did they go and start taking payday loans out? Right? So... Mm. I think you've got to look, and I think when you look at it in that term, you've got 350 people who've got to do all that. Right. That's, that's, that's really, really difficult. So, so I would much prefer if, you, if we split these things out and they were funded properly and we encouraged innovation to look at things and crucially data, data, data. So I really like that idea of separating out the remit between licensing that and regulation and safer gambling. I mean, I think, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find anybody that's not for safer gambling. You know, nobody wants the person who's addicted to, to sports betting to be, you know, using their product and all that kind of stuff. I think the important question is that nobody, at least I've not heard anybody kind of addressing is like, where's the line between the company's responsibility and personal responsibility? And, you know, obviously we have access to all this data, you know, you mentioned the camera, but like, 
it just, it feels so invasive to me. And I don't know, I can't think of another industry that goes to that level. Like even if you have a therapist appointment or a doctor appointment um, remotely, I don't think that they want to say like, can you give access to my Fitbit so I can monitor your heart rate while we're doing therapy? Like, and so the idea that like, it sounds like a really nice idea. Like let's monitor the heart rate of a, of a, somebody who we suspect a problem gambling to see if they're, you know, in the red zone, but like that, doesn't that just feel like a giant well, invasion of, of privacy? I think it was, um, it was uh, Richard Feynman, the, the physicist, the lover quotes. And he said something along the lines of, I'd much rather be able to ask questions that I can't get answered than to have answers that I can't question. And I think in this case, we need to be able to push the envelope. And you've just said something that I think is spot on. Personal determination, vulnerability, that's a volatile thing, even within somebody on the same day, mm. let alone factors that they're predisposed to. I mean, you look at um, dopamine and neurotransmitters and all these things. I see in the games market, in the casual games market, people getting exciting, they're getting their dopamine hit. People are also taking risks and their neurotransmitters aren't going off as well. So they're not seem to, they're seemingly impaired by it. Now, if we're not prepared to ask the questions about it, I think you then end, end up coming up with blanket solutions. And where do the blanket solutions lead to? That's my thing about the two pounds. Two pounds mm. versus one point. Look at all the stuff around affordability. What does that mean? Mm. Right? So affordability. So what? I've got to go and send them my paycheck and all the rest of it. Am I going to tell them how many kids I've got? They've got my bank statement, okay? We've got bank statement for one of my accounts. So they've got all of my accounts. It just seems a step in the right direction, but fuzzy as well. Yeah, and, and, and the UKGC think... doesn't give strong, you know, we've had to wrestle with that to an enormous degree. And I feel like, I don't, here's where I don't blame the, the UKGC, but they're, they're essentially asking operators to act as financial police. Like governments do not have appropriate financial police. I, I have no idea how many people work in the serious crimes office in the UK, but my guess is it's low, you know, not very many for the proportion of financial crime that goes on. And basically, the, for those of you that don't know, the UKGC requires us to certify that the money that comes in, not certify officially, but represent that the money that comes in is is not a proceed of crime and the person can afford it and that they don't have a gambling addiction. And it's incredible. It's an incredible amount of overhead that we have to do. Like we, we have to ask for bank statements, sometimes tax, tax statements, and we have to look for proof of income. And it's an incredibly invasive process. And I, you know, I, I totally think it's from a good place. You know, who wants financial crime? Like we all want clean money and, and people that are, you know, on the up and up and all that kind of stuff. But it's an incredible burden that the UKGC uh, is putting on operators. Um, so I like to your point, I think a lot of the intent is good, but there hasn't been a lot of, of thought behind the, the most effective. I, would, I wouldn't necessarily lay the blame on the UKGC. I think governments themselves are vastly under-resourced uh, looking at financial crime and all that kind of stuff. You know, like the other thing too is like if we get a deposit from Lloyd's, you know, we're beating up on Lloyd's a little bit, but if we get a deposit from Lloyd's that's stolen money, you know, Lloyd's technically is supposed to be on the hook, but we still have to go, like we can't assume that the money coming from a Lloyd's checking account is clean money. You know, we are still liable to to come to some threshold of that we think this is is clean money. Um, well, I think this your... is another interesting thing. That's where the GC has to be all things to all people in some ways. And then it has to throw things onto the operators, less on the suppliers, but also things on the suppliers, which mm. I think is tough. And you, know, you look at open banking, right? I think open banking is probably a very good thing. Um, you know, do you end up in a situation where your wallet, if not your PAM, but your wallet is directly through open banking? So instead of somebody depositing funds to you, actually, all the onus is then on the bank, which is an exceptionally difficult thing to become a UK bank, a genuine UK bank with a license. There's been like two created in the last hundred years who see all of the funds coming in and coming out. Mm. And then the operator can get on with assuming, with I think some assurity that the funds have been deposited legally. You can then get into some sort of discussion with open banking 
around affordability, which must see all the transactions and must have a much better picture of, well, you know, you can imply that this person's got four kids and it's very different to be earning 50K a year with four kids versus, you know, 50K a year with no kids, right? That has to change the affordability as well. Now, that to me just seems doomed to failure and edge cases, which will become significant and will change with a gambling operator, Mm. right? And how many companies would be able to stomach that level of insight and that level of ongoing protection? You know, do you end up then ironically making the UK market less competitive because you're going to have less operators? And do you end up with a small number of Goliath operators a la the National Lottery? in sportsbook because they're frankly the only ones who can actually run through all of these processes which we all agree are good things to have in place but the overhead to it mm. are there other places that are better suited to doing that just uh, one other comment i wanted to make on what you said was that you know data 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 um you know as somebody that you know as an operator we have shitloads in, of data like we have data that has data that has data the, you know, sort of similar to your question about uh, sort your point about tennis betting and like, why don't they just show me the right bet? You know, it is one thing to have the data, but it is another thing to very intelligently parse that data. So I would imagine that two pound, one pound, 10 pound question of minimum or maximum stake, whatever for an FBOT, FOBT is that's actually probably a pretty hard question to answer. And so there probably aren't the right qualified people looking at the data and trying to figure that out. And it's probably also messy to get the data to. So I, I, even though it's like the technology is there, it's actually, I think quite a hard problem to, de to determine uh, what the line should be. And One I of my agree, which is even more reason to look at guys, let's make this anonymized and open. Maybe the data is three months old constantly. But what is that data? Does that have where they live, like what their job is, all that kind of stuff? Like that, I because that's... Really to, I, think probably, I think you could experiment with it. I think start off with session, unique sessions of users over yeah. that you can then look at over periods of time so you can see their pattern of behavior. Maybe you do add to it postcode so you can get a flavor for the area they're living in, the general wealth of that area. I think that that has to be available to be researched, to be able to provide any sort of insight. Because I think, it, and also it changes over the time. You know, we speak about progressive taxation. We speak about progressive legislation. You've got to have the stream of data to be able to inform it, to make it progressive. If there's any researchers out there that want to look at our anonymized data, I'm happy to share that with a researcher. Like I, I would, I would be all for trying to crowdsource and open source some kind of uh, a more pragmatic approach to it. I think that's a good idea. Um, one of my just uh, last thing on on regulation. One of my pet peeves with the UKGC. Uh, before we beat up on them too too well, uh, too much. I should also say, like I think they are generally speaking, in a, like a great organization. I think the UK, out of all the countries I've seen, including the US, including Malta, including Sweden and Denmark, I think the UK GC has the right approach, the right balance between regulation and restriction. I think you know, my, my pet peeves with the UK GC is they facilitate a lot of operators that operate in illegal markets. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to look at the Premier League and look at all the jerseys and and sponsors of the Premier League, almost all of them are in illegal markets. And there are also notable examples of UK based operators that are taking money in China and other illegal markets. And they turn they turn their a blind eye to that. And I get very frustrated because, uh, you know, for those of you that don't know, the nice thing about illegal markets is there's a few nice things. One, there's no regulation. So you don't have to do a lot of these checks. You don't have to, you know, a lot of these things that add to the unit economics that make things more expensive. And the second thing is because it's an illegal uh, place to operate. Generally, there's fewer competitors because fewer people sort of want to cross that line. Um, so I think in the UK, you have a lot of people bidding up marketing assets that are operating illegal markets vis-a-vis -vis the Premier League and other places. And you also have UK operators that are making a lot of money in China and other places that are basically using that money to fund their UK operations. Do you have a view on that? Do you think that's a big problem or do you think I'm exaggerating the problem? I, th I think, no, I, I can see, look, I'm not on the operating side, but I can see why that would be an enormous frustration. I think the only one that does full root and branch is Nevada. Yeah. Where they want to look through everything. 
Yeah. And in Nevada, you know, people have got to go in front of a judge and they've got to swear um, yeah. on a on a Bible or whatever about X, Y, and Z, which is a meaningful, a very meaningful thing. Again, it comes down to the GC. What view do they want to take on the world? And I think that's a great example of an input. You've got a whole lot of marketing money coming from other markets. Therefore, that should be of some level of interest, one would imagine, because that's funding that business. Now, how much effort goes into the upfront licensing versus the ongoing tax and point of consumption take, and then the ongoing reviews of operations and how things are being funded? Plus all the other stuff we've spoken about, you've got 350 people. You would imagine if you had an entity that was looking at licensing and the purpose of the licensing and where it's all coming from, it's going to have a lot more opportunity to look at what you've just spoken about and to try and come up with answers mm. and how justifiable those answers are. You, right. you, you, you mentioned Nevada. I, I have experience in Nevada. I don't know if they've changed the regulation, but three or four years ago, I, we, we went pretty far down the path to get to, to be legal in Nevada. And while their intent is good, I think they make a lot of mistakes with their regulation. For example, you have to be affiliated with a casino, which I think is a mistake because I think sports betting has nothing to do with a physical casino or you know, a, a virtual casino. So I, I think that the idea that sports betting has to be gone, done through the casino industry is a giant mistake. It's bad for consumers and it's bad for the state. The other thing Nevada, I think, really made a mistake on is they had, I think, very onerous um, – the visitation requirements and each, all the directors had to get uh, personally scrutinized. And I believe, you know, maybe it's not a big deal for a big company for a startup. I, I believe the bill would have been two to $3 million. I, I might be off by a little bit, but it was like low single digit million dollars for us just to get the license, which I totally respect, um, you know, due diligence and all that kind of stuff, but you got to be able to do due diligence for less than $2 million. You know, we, uh, us as a company, we've been audited by KPMG for years. Like we're open kimono company. Like people can come check out, you know, I, I, I like the intent, but I think Nevada just like got the big stuff wrong, even though that, you know, they, they were coming from a good place. So I still would yeah. say hands down as somebody that had experience with the UKGC and Nevada, I would say UKGC all, all day long. I think it also looks pretty inevitable that the you know the example of the short sponsorship that you speak about that would seem reading between the lines to be on the way out. Yeah, but I mean, to me, that's a cop out because I mean, yeah, I think it's you know it's easy to sort of do the cigarette ban, you know, fine, you know, if they want to ban jerseys, I you know I don't have a big opinion on that, but I I think it kind of it gives the UKGSC a pass where like I do think they had the remit and the authority. Uh, and the obligation to kind of go after these illegal markets. And I think they just, I think they turned a blind eye to it. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been disappointed about that. Yeah. Awesome. I forgot to ask, where, where do we find you today? I'm in my garden office in Southwest London. With Fantastic. the air conditioning on. Before air conditioning? That's very American of you. With the air conditioning. Very Scottish. Can't take the heat, Jason. Can't take the heat. <laughs> So I'm but, cool. uh, before we let you go, what do you want to be when you grow up? I love reading. Uh, I don't like, don't like consuming all that much TV, although I read loads of trash. And it's like just about every time after, and I read nonfiction. And just about every time after I've read nonfiction, I want to go and do that. So if you'd asked me six months ago, I probably wanted to be somebody who built high-end motorbikes. Uh, okay. Last week, I wanted to be a watchmaker in Switzerland. I was quite okay. happy to give everything up, go and get a pipe, go and do that. Um, I think ultimately, though, I love watching things get built and I love being involved. I just don't quite have the chutzpah anymore to go and do it myself on my own and to have a startup, but I certainly invest in them and I certainly love working with them. And that's kind of the, probably the big bit of passion of what I do. So when I grow up, I'd like to be a benevolent venture capitalist who okay. can actually get involved with more than just money. I think that's the, that's the stuff that I find the most rewarding. You get to work with people who are most passionate about things um, and you can see a big impact 
right? You can see a big impact in that, whether it's games, whether it's betting and gaming. I think there's all kinds of ripe things for for that, and that's the bit I that's the bit I enjoy probably the most. Well, it sounds like you're in you're on the right track to being a benevolent venture capitalist in the space. So, oh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure yet. Yeah. More more M and A deals. There's always time for watchmaking. For sure. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. And if somebody wants to get in touch with you, where can they find you? Um, just poll at socoadvisors.com. We'll put it, I guess we'll put it in the show notes. We'll sure. Email there. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much, Paul. Wonderful. Thank you, Jason.